Okay. Nope, we're good. This is later. Yeah, Chris will come right. later. You guys are ready. Hello, everybody. Good evening and welcome. Hello. It is so wonderful to see all of you here. I'm Jennifer DeSimus. I'm the library director of First Church West Hartford, the John P. Webster Library. No relation to Noah. <laughs> um, but uh, we're a public library. Um, open to the public, and we invite you all to come and check it out. We're underneath the Meeting House, um, and it's a library that's devoted to spiritual resources and um, interfaith, uh, and also social justice issues such as we're here to discuss tonight. So thank you for coming, and thank you for being a part of these very important conversations as we go forward. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Jen Matos, director of the Webster House. Thank you. So I want to start off by thanking Jennifer and uh, the First Church and the John P. Webster Library for hosting and supporting this program. Uh, my name is Jennifer Matos. I'm the executive director at the Noah Webster House in West Hartford Historical Society. And together with the Connecticut Human Rights Partnership, um, we are so pleased to, um, to have you here tonight at our Native Identity, a Historical Perspective program, which has been designed to commemorate and honor Indigenous Peoples Day. And this is the first year in West Hartford that we are honoring Indigenous Peoples Day in the, in the school system. Um, so that's quite an accomplishment in and of itself. Um, if you haven't ever been, the Noah Webster House in West Hartford Historical Society is located on South Main Street, just a mile outside of the center, um, and of course is centered around the birthplace of Noah Webster, our forgotten founding father, and the creator of uh, the American English we speak today. We also serve as a repository for all things West Hartford history. Um, and that includes um, you know, a desire to teach the history of the Native people who were in our own community. West Hartford, and we have um, much more work to do to, to do that successfully. Um, so I'm excited tonight uh, to hear what our speakers have to say. Before I introduce them, I just want to thank Judy Wyman Kelly. Um, she's with the Connecticut Human Rights Partnership, and this is the second year we've worked together to do an educational program on Indigenous Peoples Day. So we thank her for continuing her work with us. Um, I also want to thank Jennifer Evans and West Hartford Community Television. Um, this is being recorded and will be available online and, and um, on WCTV. Uh, and finally, I want to thank Connecticut Humanities, who has graciously funded this program and made it uh, available to all of you. Um, so now I'd like to introduce our speakers uh, tonight. Um, first, I'd like to um, introduce Paul Oak. Um, he is a tribal elder and historian of the Narragansett, Pequot, and Wampanoag tribes. We have Dr. Jason Mancini, who is the executive director of the Connecticut Humanities and a co-founder of Agamot. Um, and then I have Indonis, who's also a co-founder of, of Agamot Educational uh, Initiative. Um, so we are so delighted they all traveled from afar to come here today, so we're delighted to have them. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to see all of you here. I'd like to just begin very quickly by acknowledging uh, the homelands of the Tonksas and Podunk peoples, um, whom um, these, these lands we are on tonight. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the contemporary stewards of these lands, the five tribes that are still uh, in existence in Connecticut, uh, the Mashantucket Pequot, the Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Pagasset and Mohegan tribes. These are all communities that um, still live amongst us um, and uh, um, deserve uh, the acknowledgement that we offer them um, for their stewardship of the lands and, and the cultures today. Um, I'm Jason Mancini. I, uh, I come to this program and presentation uh, from multiple seats uh, as an executive director of Connecticut Humanities, as a co-founder of Agamout Educational Initiative, and from a long career uh, at the Mashantucket Pequot Museum and Research Center, where I spent uh, about 32 years on the reservation doing research, and most recently 
as the executive director of that organization. During that time, um, I've worked with uh, and collaborated with Native people uh, from across the region and beyond um, to explore uh, their histories and cultures with them as an ally to them. Um, and I'm here to sort of contextualize some of uh, uh, tonight's discussion, but also um, sort of laying the groundwork that Indonis and Talok will spend a bit more time on, and hopefully we can have a uh, fruitful discussion about afterwards. Um, so that slide, okay. Um, what I'd like to do is just sort of orient us to the landscape and to the way that um, Native people see the land. Um, homelands are um, defined, but they're also irregular. Um, they don't have fixed geopolitical boundaries like we see state boundaries today. Um, and this is, a, this is a map that's been developed around Native homelands across the world um, just to resituate what we think we know about Native people, which is in stark contrast to what we see every day in these state geographies, in these town geographies. Um, and oftentimes these, these boundaries are set up artificially and arbitrarily uh, in, in, in contrast to the way Native people live on the land. Um, and in my own research over the past 30 or so years, um, it's been extraordinary um, to learn so much about the Native communities, not just from conversations, but from archives and being able to look past town boundaries, past state boundaries, past the boundaries of land and onto the oceans. Um, and that's where some of the most interesting stuff has come from in the ways in which I've come to understand uh, Native community dynamics, social networks, and identity uh, over vast spans of time. In which, um, again, Talok and Andonis will be speaking of from a deep personal lived experience. Um, that's still there. Um, what I'd like to do is just talk really quickly uh, about shifting economies because um, the, the way that Native people orient themselves to one another um, and, and um, to their surroundings is often through space, through land, uh, and through foods. Um, the traditional subsistence economies from this region that, that sustained Native people for thousands of years uh, was really through uh, hunting, fishing, cultivation, gathering. And these were done in ways that were um, e extensive. Um, there's a, a lived relationship with the land um, that, that um, uh, really rooted people to space. Um, and in, in the nine million acres of southern New England, this was really Indian country, it was, it was theirs. Um, and that changed very rapidly with the arrival of Europeans. Um, and with that, a whole new relationship began to emerge. Um, initially through trading relationships and partnerships where we saw the exchange of European produced items, metals, glass, um, uh, things like that, for native made uh, uh, shell beads called wampum, uh, furs, uh, these all became part of a new kind of economy around the Atlantic world. Um, and these were the sources uh, initially of companionship and friendship and new relationships, but very quickly turned to hostilities uh, and, and eventually war. Um, and that's something you'll hear a lot more about. Um, oops. Okay, so um, these hostilities culminated um, very quickly, we, we know the, the pilgrims were here uh, in 1620. There had been some uh, European traders here in the century or so before. But as the influx of uh, Europeans overwhelmed um, uh, the presence of native people here and the impact of disease during this, uh, these initial years of contact, they had a devastating effect, but uh, so did uh, the ways in which native people uh, in Europeans, specifically the English, uh, were, were engaged with one another. And this ultimately led to an attack on the uh, fort, Pequot Fort at Mystic, in which an entire village of men, women, and children uh, were brutally murdered and burned uh, alive. Um, oh, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, coming out of this conflict set into play 
um, a very new reality and one that saw the transformation of those nine million acres of Indian country um, in, in a little more than a few generations to about 30,000 acres of land. Um, and to, to really understand that transformation um, and how devastating it was, um, you need to understand how being disconnected from everything that you know, everything, all the people, the language, the plants and the animals, um, precipitated radical change um, to the communities of southern New England. And um, that 30,000 acres that, that eventually uh, uh, Indian country was reduced to was sporadic, it was scattered, um, and they're what were the, the origins of what we call reservations today. Um, and the first reservations in North America were here in Connecticut um, and in the aftermath of the Pequot War. Um, what we see from that time period is a series of wars from King Philip's War, which was uh, another colonial war against native people and native power, and that essentially transformed the way uh, the power structure in New England worked. Um, and, it, and New England's history from that point on really became overwhelmed by uh, the political, legal, and militaristic uh, realities of English settlement. So the settler colonial reality then um, transformed everything. Um, and what we have, yeah, the next one, yeah. Um, what we have then are new systems. Uh, new systems in the way people interacted with one another and people engaged um, uh, the land and so on. So just very briefly, what I want to talk about here is this transformation of landscape. So these, um, these carefully managed and cultivated landscapes by native people um, quickly became uh, overwhelmed, parceled out, divided, allotted by Europeans. Uh, forests became fields. Um, uh, animals uh, were pastured, and within a generation or two, 95% uh, of New England was essentially deforested. Uh, and that precipitated new relationships. Native people could no longer live on the land the way that they knew. Uh, it was vastly different than they, their parents or their grandparents could have ever imagined. And on top of that, what we start to see are the new realities of the enslaved Africans being forcibly brought here, um, and brought here from Africa, native people being enslaved and sent to the Caribbean, and this entire new Atlantic world economy that centered on the movement of people and of resources that upended uh, the, the operations of social um, well-being and um, community engagement and fostered new kinds of changes. So, from a, a century of, of dispossession of land, enslavement and servitude and uh, warfare came new kinds of realities. Um, and for the first time in human history, what you have is people from four different continents coming together and interacting socially and sexually, producing new kinds of people that defied the way Europeans classified, um, but confronted the way uh, in which native people began to redefine themselves in their communities. Okay, thank you. Um, so what we have are new, a new power imbalance where native people no longer have control over the land, um, but they do have control over uh, their kin, they have control over their identity, and they have control over um, their social networks. Um, and, and they're a connection to homelands. Um, and that's something that you'll hear about repeatedly tonight. Um, one, of the, one of the new things that, that began to shape uh, native peoples and communities was a new economy. I talked about subsistence economies uh, earlier. As um, is, is, is native people were, were dispossessed of land, they had to find new ways to feed themselves, their families, their communities. And they began to participate more actively in a market economy. And in doing so, they had to sell their labor. So what that meant was you become either farm labor, you become, um, uh, you, en you enlist in the military. And increasingly what we see is, especially for native men, is uh, a movement towards the ocean, towards the ports and onto the onto <coughs> ships and into the ocean. For women, that meant um, local uh, crafts, basket making, 
um, in other uh, uh, home economies. Um, so, and, and so this, this really reflects some of that. We see native communities uh, redefining themselves um, as new people are coming together. Um, and increasingly, and especially through the, the American whale fishery, um, native people are getting on vessels and traveling the waters of the world and ending up in foreign lands um, as far away as New Zealand, uh, Hawaii, Alaska. And in the same way as, as these American um, ships are going to these foreign places, they're bringing people from those places back home. So if you've ever read Moby Dick and you, you, you um, hear from Herman Melville, all of the different ethnicities that are on the street in New Bedford, the same exact thing is happening in New London and Stonington and Mystic. Um, and these are some of the most incredibly diverse places on the planet. And those people don't just reside there. They're going and interacting on the reservations and with other native peoples and other native communities. And they're becoming um, uh, um, engaged with one another. Um, and, and so that is producing new kinds of rules and governance systems. And native tribes are beginning to redefine themselves. In the absence of so much land, they're, re, they're recalibrating what it is to be a tribal citizen of a particular community. Um, and sometimes that means um, excluding people. Um, and we see that more and more through the um, 18th and especially the 19th centuries. Um, so tri as tribes are redefining themselves, new, um, new definitions of identity begin to emerge. Um, I'm not going to get into all this right now, and I hope there will be room uh, for some of this in the discussion. And again, you'll hear a little bit more about this. But um, one of the most important things that is keeping Native people connected to one another is their social networks and their economies and their unwillingness to bend to these colonial constructed boundaries of land, state, um, um, and town. Um, so people are, are crossing these very willfully. Um, to stay um, connected to one another. Um, okay, um, and just very quickly um, to give you a sense of how confusing this might be for European eyes. Um, this is one person. His name's Amasa Lawrence. He is um, he's well known uh, Pequot tribal member. He was uh, known on the back of this carte de visite of the Pequots during the Civil War as the chief of the Pequots. And you'll see all of the different categories of complexion or race that occurred during his lifetime and even beyond his lifetime. Um, and you'll see that uh, race is remarkably subjective. And this is from an outsider perspective, but this person knew who he was. He knew he was Pequot, um, regardless of how people saw him from the outside. Um, I should probably leave it there. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll conclude with that. Um, and turn it over to Andonis um, for the next round. Sure. Um, and we had a we had a, another member of Agamount join us, so um, I want to welcome. He's coming straight from uh, the Museum of Fine Art in Boston, and he oh, wow. uh, just arrived. And so this is not just a random person who decided to come sit up here with us. Uh, this is uh, one of our co-founders of the Agama Educational Initiative. This is Chris Newell, and he will um, help us facilitate the Q&A section um, at the end and help us um, move along the discussion. So I want to welcome Chris and uh, welcome him off I-95. Um, <laughs> 84. Uh, so good evening. Uh, Ojibwe people, Bashish Chin, Tanisani Dishiche, Do Chakta, Chikisa, people, Dishinele. Hi everyone, I'm Indana Spears. Uh, I am Yucca Fruit strung out in a lion clan uh, from the Diné and Navajo people. I'm born for the Ojibwe people. My maternal grandfather is from the Tangle clan, and my paternal grandfather is from the Chakta and Chikisa people. Um, all of those tribes are located um, in different parts of Turtle Island, and I made my way here um, to this part of Turtle Island um, when I was in graduate school, and I met um, my husband, and I now live in uh, traditional Narragansett homelands with him and my Narragansett, now married into Narragansett family. And uh, I wanted to take a little bit of a different angle um, than some of my uh, co-panelists here in looking at identity and some of the things that uh, Jason introduced about identity. 
um, I want to propose the idea that along with uh, the dispossession of land, the dispossession of our traditional forms of kinship um, were just as devastating. And that by enacting our traditional ways of knowing how we make identity and family, we are pushing back against these colonial constructs of basically patrilineality or tracing lineage through men. Um, and so I, I talk about this um, kind of from a dual perspective from my own culture, the Diné and Navajo people are uh, matrilineal people, and I want to talk a little bit about what that means. But also the native people who, uh, whose homeland you're living on right now were also matrilineal people. And uh, the native people who uh, live here in uh, what is termed New England um, are also uh, matrilineal people. And so um, that is very important in, in shaping identity and shaping community. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that this evening. Um, one of the things that sets, uh, uh, sure, thank you. One of the things that sets um, matrilineal societies apart um, from those that are uh, patrilineal is our creation stories. And so if we think about, um, for Diné people or Navajo people, we have a primary uh, female uh, creator um, that created our clan system, the system I utilize to introduce myself in our language. Um, and uh, she created our clans literally from her body at the very beginning of time. And so we owe her our kinship system and our way of knowing ourselves and one another. And as I hate to use generalizations, but well, I'll use a generalization, as Native people, one of the things that defines us is that we do not um, identify as individuals, but our identity is based in who we're related to and who our community is. And so um, in our creation story, our first woman, this deity changing woman, created our clans and our kinship system, along with a lot of other rules that Navajos need to uh, follow and abide by. And this image here, is an image by uh, Bruce King, who is Oneida, uh, depicting Sky Woman, another primary female uh, deity who uh, is responsible for humanity and responsible for creating uh, the Haudenosaunee people. And so um, one thing that uh, is a vast difference from other origin stories that begin with a man where a woman is created from his rib or is created as an afterthought uh, for many of our matrilineal societies, the primary uh, deity is a female, and um, that is a very big difference than some other um, origin stories that are based in tracing lineage and um, uh, power through men. Um, so I, I think my Google Slides is not talking to the PowerPoint, so I'll read this for you. Um, this is a poem from Danette, um a uh, poet, Lucy Tapahanso, talking about changing woman and talking about what her influence has been on, on us as a, as a culture. And she says, because of her, we think and create. Because of her, we make songs. Because of her, the designs appear as we leave. Because of her, we tell stories and laugh. We believe in old values and new ideas. And the concept that changing woman, as is implied by her name, is dynamic and that our culture is dynamic, and our deities are dynamic, and they allow us to um, exist now and into the future. And so does our uh, systems of kinship. Another thing that sets our understanding of lineage through women um, apart from uh, more patriarchal systems is associating um, the earth with uh, the feminine. So associating the earth with Mother Earth or a provider or someone who sustains our physical uh, bodies, but also our spiritual realities as well. And so when we are talking about the Wabanaki people or the Pequot people and Narragansett people, we are placing them in a specific geography, in a specific homeland. And by doing so, we are also talking about something that is feminine. So we can't talk about homeland or talk about these concepts that Jason was outlining before without um, also understanding that we are talking about a female entity, a Mother Earth. And so um, it is implied within our names for ourselves. So the name Wabanaki means people of the first light. The name Pequot means people of the shallow water, which is uh, 
in reference to the Long Island Sound and the, uh, the resources and the uh, religion that people were able to cultivate uh, together with the landscape, um, we, are, we have to recognize that we're talking about a, a female entity in Mother Earth. And so um, this image here by uh, Muskogee Creek and Salagi artist uh, Virginia Stroud is an image of the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. Um, the horticulturalists or the people who are living here in New England, um, they um, put forth women as being in charge of uh, the gardens. And so because of that control of a steady and reliable food source, Native women here uh, asserted social and political power. And so these three sisters, the corn, beans, and squash, are named thus, not the three brothers, because they are in the domain of women and because women have control over how that food is dispersed. And that um, makes them a powerful entity within the community. And so I've been talking a little bit about here in New England, which is my uh, adopted home and the homeland of my husband and my children. Um, but I also want to uh, give you some insight into how other matrilineal societies and my own specifically um, in what is present day, uh, the Four Corners area, so uh, Northern Arizona, New Mexico, uh, Utah, and uh, Colorado, um, where they live. And so, um, when I introduced myself and my language, I um, listed four clans. Um, and so my mother is Navajo, but my father is not. So uh, I utilized my father's tribes in place of what would traditionally be um, two other clans. And so in the Navajo way, we introduce ourselves in this way so that if there are Navajos here in this audience tonight, they would know how we are related. And they would know what kind of kinship we, uh, we, what kind of kinship ties we have to one another. And uh, this is very clever because it allows for Navajo people or Diné people who are traditionally supposed to be living within a very specific landscape to travel outside of that and still find family. And so um, it's a really um, fortuitous, but also um, uh, an important uh, system that our primary female entity foresaw a day when Navajo people would have to find kinship when we are traveling outside of the four sacred mountains or our homeland. So um, that is the way that we define our identity um, in the contemporary way. And so we utilize this kin kinship system to find kin and family um, across, uh, across the world. And this does not um, require a uh, blood quantum uh, uh, stated on a certificate. It does not require a card stating what tribe we belong to, or it does not require some of the paperwork uh, that the federal government requires of Native people to prove identity. That instead, by enacting these other forms of kinship, by knowing your clans and stating them and relating to other people in this way, we are acting in non-colonial ways and we are subverting a system that was meant to erase us, which is the concept of blood quantum and enrollment. Um, so, so kinship determines, our kinship system determines who we can marry, who, who we can't marry, um, who uh, we are related to, and also some, some plans come from specific parts of the Navajo Reservation. There are over 50 active clans uh, today, um, so uh, knowing where those clans are kind of located um, along northern, around northern Arizona and into um, the other three states I mentioned is very useful. And I just threw this in here just because also maybe clan determines how good of a memory you have. Um, so this is an image of first grader Grady Begay who won uh, at the Navajo Nation Science Fair about uh, asking the question, does clan affect memory? So he went around with a test where he asked different Diné people in his community um, to remember flashcards and he categorized them by which clan has the best memory. And he, uh, he won, um, he won uh, for his experiment at the Navajo Nation Science Fair. And so um, the fact that you are able to test which clans of yours have the best memory shows that it's an active and lived system. And there is no writing down of this. When you're born, no one hands you a card that says, here are your clans. This is, the, this is something that your mother 
and your grandmother and your aunties will tell you and you will learn how to speak in that way. So there is no kind of paper trail if we are to think about the identity in forms of card carrying or census number or things of that nature. So, um, so also it's a, it's a, lived, uh, a lived experience. It's a lived uh, kinship system. And I don't have very much time, and I don't want to go too uh, far into this, but um, the United States has enacted um, certain measures to erase these forms of understanding family and community. And that an assault on these forms of knowing our kinship is an assault on feminine power. And so, um, so I won't go um, too deeply into this, but um, acts like the Indian Reorganization Act, which required tribal entities and governments to uh, formulate themselves in a way that mimicked the United States, that automatically writes out traditional forms of governance that included or relied upon the knowledge of women. It also, um, amongst other forms of traditional knowledge, but this, um, these acts are because they degrade our, our way of governing and our way of forming family and kinship and the power of women, they, uh, they ultimately were able to uh, uh, work to erase the sustainability of our cultures and the health of our community is indicated by the health of our women. So um, these are some of those measures that were explicitly um, an assault on our traditional ways of knowing identity and family, kinship and governance. And so I think this is my lot. Yes, it is. Um, so um, just to kind of bring this into, again, a kind of uh, larger understanding of Native people and Indigenous people today um, and how this, uh, this idea of gender is really overlaid in a lot of the things that we are talking about here tonight. The primary activists, um, uh, for the uh, Dakota Access Pipeline and water protectors there um, at Standing Rock were women and it was a woman-led movement and that is not a mistake, that is not just a coincidence that the protection of the earth is also bound up in protection of women and led by women. Um, these are all related and intertwined with one another and that is um, the part of identity that I kind of wanted to bring forth this evening that in all the discussions that we're having here um, we can't talk about identity without talking about the stronghold of kinship systems that are based on women and lineage through women um, so I wanted to um, just end there and um, and turn it over uh, graciously uh, to and humbly to Tall Oak. So thank you so much for, for your attention this evening. Often have I heard these Indians say, these English will deliver us of all that's ours, our lands and lives. In the end, they will bereave us. It's a Narragansett prophecy that was recorded by Roger Williams, who uh, has been identified as the founder of Rhode Island, the first Englishman, first Englishman to settle in the Narragansett country. And uh, he wrote an interesting book that you might uh, have the time to uh, take advantage of. It's called A Key into the Language of America. And actually, I see it as not just a key into the language of America, it's a key into America, because he records the lifestyle at the earliest contact, so you'll see how our people lived before they were influenced by changes that were brought about by the arrival of the Europeans. Is, that, is this any better? Oh, yeah. that's yeah. 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 Okay, um, so I start off with that because uh, that's an important part of uh, how our people looked at things when they first started to take place around us. And it's a key into the future. And, uh, and everything else I have to talk about tonight has to do with all those things that our people ob observed because it, we were extremely perceptive. And out of that, I have to tell you, my mission in life is to ensure that terrorism, greed, intolerance, and hypocrisy have a witness to their history and their legacy. And all of my adult life I've spent in 
uh, studying the history of our people and the interaction of our people with those who came here, the people we call Awanagisik, Awanaksak, or the strangers, because we knew who we were, but we didn't know who they were. So we call them the strangers. My obligation, as I see it, is to speak for my ancestors who have paid with their blood for what little we may have today and to hold on to it best we can for our generations yet unborn. This is how we honor our ancestors, for we are the zoom lens that illuminates and magnifies what needs to be seen clearly within the culture of deception and denial that we are totally submerged in. So out of that, I have put everything under what I call the, uh, the contradictions of America. So uh, some of the images I have, uh, well, all the images I have of, of my own creation, because besides my passion for uh, our, our uh, history, I have my other passion for my artwork. So I've combined the two into some of the collages and the images I've put together so that uh, my feelings can't be misunderstood because uh, you all have heard that one picture's worth a thousand words. Well, I, uh, I don't like to be misunderstood, so that's why I put all these things together so that you will um, have that knowledge uh, by the time I leave here. So I have... Um, placement, so I can go smoothly with everything, but uh, I don't know if I was as careful as I uh, was trying to be. I have macular degeneration now. I was just given the good news uh, after I had my brain surgery in uh, February. So uh, I have all these things working against me, so uh, trying to put my things together and uh, find everything in its proper place is all impacted by uh, all of those things that I've been uh, dealing with uh, relatively recently at the age of 83. So I, I'm thankful that I'm here, the Creator. I, I give thanks to the Creator for all I've been given, but most especially the wonderful family, family and friends that I've been blessed with, because without all the family and friends that I have, I couldn't have accomplished anything that I have. And all the words that I share with you now I have to be grateful for all the wonderful people that the Creator has put in my path because um, I've come to the conclusion after burying uh, two of my sons, the Creator blessed us, my wife and I, with four, four sons, one for each season of the year. He took two back and we have two left. So in that process I had a lot of things to think about, very deeply. and. Uh, one of the important things that I've come to realize out of all that experience is that there are no uh, accidents. We call them accidents because we don't know the Creator's plan. The Creator has plans for everything from the day we're born, for each and every one of us, depending on the gifts we've each been blessed with. Uh, we all, all are born with a purpose. We cross, cross paths for a reason because there are no accidents and everything is part of the Creator's plan. What role do we each have to play? That's the question we all have to ask ourselves individually. A very personal question. That depends on the gifts we each have uh, been blessed with and the choices we each make and how we use those gifts to make this a better world. And that's the ultimate objective of everything I have to say. I don't know how much longer I'll have here on the earth. I'm a 40-year cancer survivor as well as the brain surgery. So those two things uh, could have taken me away, but the Creator has left me here, I know, for a reason, because it's part of his plan. So I have to make sure I use whatever time I have left on this earth and not knowing how long that's going to be in the way that he intended when he blessed me with the individual gifts I've been given. And one of the gifts I was given is this passion, this hunger for the knowledge of all of our history, and that's why I've spent all of my time during my adult life trying to find all the parts and the pieces 
And in that process, I found all those contradictions that are America. Because most of the history we've all been taught has all been sanitized in order to make patriotism possible. And I'll start off uh, to give the best example of that in uh, my analysis of the Liberty Bell and American terrorism. People create symbols, but symbols control people. In 1776, there were 539,000 black Americans uh, that were owned by the rest of the white population of 2,600,000 white colonists. That's the reality of the beginning of America at the time of the Liberty Bell, okay? A lot of things you don't know about the Liberty Bell I'm gonna share with you now because it's all come out of my research. The Liberty Bell weighing 2,000 pounds was made in 1752 in London, England, while the African slave trade was flourishing here in the English colonies. And 1,236 slaves were brought across the Atlantic that year on Rhode Island slave ships alone. While this symbol of freedom was being made in England, John Newton, the English slave trader, was still involved in the industry he later described as despicable when he found the amazing grace that we all sing of today. Land-hungry colonists, the true American terrorists, who have immortalized the bell as so sacred, were pushing the so-called frontier further and further into Indian country to increase their real estate holdings. Any Indians who dared to resist this violation of their freedoms were either slaughtered or beaten to submission. To maximize the profits that could be made on these newly confiscated Indian lands, more and more black slaves had to be uprooted from their native lands in Africa and carried here on slave ships that were often more like floating slaughterhouses with coffin-sized compartments to provide the free labor for the colonists. The common ingredient in this triangular recipe was the New England rum, which could not be produced fast enough to satisfy the insatiable appetites in this industry, as the American dream was constructed thus <coughs> at our expense. The Liberty Bell was rung on July the 8th, 1776 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to, quote, proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. From the book of Leviticus, chapter 25, verse 10. The slaughter and subjugation of any Native Americans who dared to resist the robbing of their freedoms by people who claimed to be fighting for their own perceived freedoms presented the contradiction so obvious that it should be questioned by anyone of conscience. It has to make one wonder, does America even have a conscience? Or has greed for the almighty dollar robbed the society of any conscience it may have had? One would have to wonder if the predatory for-profit society, which was established in the land of opportunity, would still be so firmly in place had the extreme, extremely obvious contradiction been questioned sincerely and completely. Instead of questioning the contradiction posed by what the Liberty Bells supposedly proclaimed, the bell was rung all the louder to drown out the question and the cries of anguish of the Native Americans being slaughtered and deceived and of the suffocating slaves crowded into the filthy ships where many of them died in their own waste before they could even be sold. It is no wonder that this Liberty Bell finally cracked in 1835, as the many completely legitimate struggles for freedom were being fought on the steadily advancing frontier in the territories of the West and in some of the most expensive real estate today in the land of the Seminoles, which we now call Florida. There are no accidents. Everything is part of the Creator's plan. That is called an accident when we do not know his plan, as I've said. When we, often call, when we often call to uh, call coincidence, you know, what we often, excuse my eyes, I'm not perfect. What we often call coincidence is in reality a God incidence. 
We therefore all share an obligation to learn the many lessons the Creator has placed in His plan. Americans' progress in this area is retarded by its denial and hypocrisy. When you don't learn the lessons that history has to teach, you are doomed to repeat them, as we now see in the news each evening as we turn on our TVs. So all of these things I've described in uh, showing the uh, story of the Liberty Bell and how I view that in terms of uh, American's history, it all reflects the evolution of America. The Pilgrims and Puritans, America's first terrorists, evolved into Indian killers, who evolved into slave traders and owners, who evolved into the entrepreneurs, who all contributed to the creation of the legacy of privilege that the beneficiaries of America's injustice enjoy today. They have not been able to build the jails fast enough to con contain all the victims of that legacy that continue to overflow into this society that refuses to confront its past. Nieo, it is so. God bless America. I bring out these things because, okay, because you each have to look within yourself to examine all these words that I've shared with you that you've probably never heard before. Because anytime I speak to any groups, they always stimulate a, a lot of uh, questions, naturally, because the things that everyone uh, hasn't heard before, especially when I go into the school systems, which I, I love to go to because that's where our future leaders are going to come from. Uh, the people that have been here too long aren't necessarily going to change too much, people in my generation. So it's the young people that are going to make the differences. The young people like Andonis and Crickets are wonderful children. They raise them with all the advantage so they can be the future leaders and bring uh, the things that have to be changed in this world because until we have those changes, all these things will continue to happen. And uh, there's a lot of other things that I, I can bring up, but uh, I'm not going to go into all of that right now. No, I had I had a slide that showed the Liberty Bell with uh, uh, Osceola, the Seminole chief, uh, image and post over that. And the inter interesting story about Osceola, I'll just have, I'll finish with that. When the Pequot uh, Skimmits in their largest powwow that they used to have uh, many years back was held here at the Civic Center in Hartford, there was a, a man that had a, a, a stand set up in the craft section. And on over, over the top of the stand it said Pete Osceola. That's right, Okay, Pete Osceola. He was a direct descendant of Osceola, who's pictured here. His portrait was done by George Catlin, the Indian, uh, the uh, famous artist that tried to paint Indians before they were all going to disappear after the Lewis and Clark expedition. And uh, so that was his mission in life. And Osceola, I had read in a, a book I had in my collection the night before I met his uh, direct descendant, Pete Osceola. And I told him what it said in the book, that he died peacefully with his family by his side. And right away he corrected me. He said, that's not true. He said he, he did not die peacefully with his family by his side. He was poisoned by the doctor whose care he was in. And that doctor's name was Frederick Whedon. The same name as my great grandfather because I carry the slave name in, among my traditional names. That is Whedon because we belong to uh, John Whedon, who owned my ancestor, Toby Whedon, an Indian slave in the island of Jamestown in the middle of Narragansett Bay. And I was surprised to hear them say that. And so he said, the reason we know that is because every generation of my family from the time of Osceola lived to be near 100 or more. So it was continuous oral tradition. And he said, that's why the seminal word for book and he was fluent in his language. He said, was translated to the paper that lies. Consider that. It's the most appropriate thing I can get across to my audiences when I speak because everyone depends on documents. We've heard talk from both of our speakers so far about documents and the difference between the, the way documents are put forward as the last word on everything. 
But the seminal word for book was the paper that lies. So, so much for the documents. You need the oral tradition to fill in the missing parts. And Pete Osceola uh, supplied me with that. I'm sorry I didn't have more time to speak with him before he died. He passed away some years after I spoke with him. But I'll treasure those words and I'll carry them the rest of my life because <coughs> of the meaning they have and the importance they have for people understanding how the history has all been sanitized in order to make patriotism possible. If most Americans, present day Americans, knew the true history, unsanitized history of America, it would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to be patriotic. And so that's what I'll close with, and uh, we'll go on to whatever's going to come next. <laughs> questions um, and uh, anything, uh, the questions for any of the panelists are open to any discussion and um, Chris uh, will help us both answer and uh, facilitate and also um, pass potentially. Okay. Um, wait, we had a request. If you do have, uh, uh, you want to come up and ask a question, if you can okay. come down so that we can see you. And if they can't come down, we can hand out paper and pen and they can write it down. Okay. So just raise your hand. Thank you. Uh, actually, I just want some clarification. Uh, Turtle Island. You mentioned Turtle Island. Uh, what does that mean? I, I, I assume it's a geographic reference, but how expansive? And the second one is, uh, was uh, the maternalistic approach actually common to Native peoples in the Americas or just in this area? Uh, so I use, I use the term Turtle Island. Um, one of the, you'll notice that um, as I try to talk about uh, this subject matter, I don't use the term um, Native American or American Indian. Um, not because those terms aren't fine, they're okay. Um, but they are in English, and so they are inherently inaccurate. Uh, because our identities, uh, they are in, uh, our names for ourselves are in our own languages. Uh, so when you meet someone who is uh, uh, classified, uh, labeled as Navajo, there are words in our own languages uh, for ourselves, in our own language would be Diné or Ojibwe, our word for ourselves is Anishinaabe. And then likewise, we also have words in our languages for uh, the place that we call our homeland. So any term that we utilize to talk about the continent that's known as the Americas um, is going to be flawed because it is in English. And especially so the concept of the United States, which is a new uh, concept to uh, this continent, um, is one that was violently established. And so um, I oftentimes will use the term Turtle Island because it um, is in reference to an uh, origin story from the Haudenosaunee people, um, as well as some other Algonquin-speaking people, including Anishinaabe people, that indicate uh, that when uh, uh, the earth was first formed, it was formed on the back of a turtle. And so um, the term Turtle Island is one that does not, um, uh, does not recognize the uh, borders that were placed over um, our own homelands, which are the borders that separate um, North and South America, Canada, the United States, and Mexico. These were all uh, traditional homelands to our people. And so um, if you are interested in learning a little bit more about how those homelands um, overlapped, how they accommodated one another, how such a large population of Native people can live in close proximity with one another without uh, uh, socio-political borders of the nation state, I encourage you to go to uh, Native Land uh, Dash CA, which um, we uh, took a, a screenshot from uh, that particular website, which looks at homelands and does not include the uh, political borders that were imposed by a colonial government. So the, con the term Turtle Island is a term in English that you will hear Native people use to refer to all of the quote-unquote Americas, or all of this continent, um, because America is also uh, associated with a, a, a white male discoverer. So that term in and of itself is problematic. Um, so uh, yes. And uh, there are matrilineal and patrilineal groups across Turtle Island. Um, so uh, it, 
both are represented um, by uh, tribes across uh, across North and South America as well. Um, my focus here in, on matrilineality is because of the location that we're in today and um, because of um, my own kind of cultural uh, knowledge and lived experience in that world. Um, but there are patrilineal uh, uh, groups that existed and continue to exist that trace clan and lineage through men. Uh, they tend to be, um, uh, they tend to be uh, more nomadic, um, as we talked about corn, beans, and squash as the three sisters and having that power. Those are uh, primarily horticulturalists or people who are in one space um, or moving around uh, once or twice a year. Whereas um, more uh, nomadic people, Lakota uh, people, um, the Absalaga people, or Crow people are uh, trace lineage through men. So I have a written down question here. What are your thoughts on truth and reconciliation happening in Maine and the rematriation or reclaiming of ancestral land? Two questions here. Uh, second question is what are your hopes for this and similar efforts? So as uh, the panel is from Maine, <laughs> uh, I guess I'll uh, work on that first question. Um, has anybody here seen Dawnland? Yes. Yeah. So the West Hartford Historical Society last year for Indigenous Peoples Day, we uh, hosted a screening of Dawnland over at the Noah Webster House. Dawnland is a documentary. It just won an Emmy, by the way, um, that documents the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the Wabanaki Truth and Reconciliation Commission in the state of Maine. And I have a feeling that this question is referencing um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in the state of Maine. And what they're talking about is the forced taking of Native children uh, through the foster care system, uh, that commission covering the years from the time the Indian Child Welfare Act was passed up until 2015. Um, so what are your thoughts on truth and reconciliation uh, happening in Maine? Um, when it comes to the state of Maine, as somebody who grew up there, uh, the state of Maine and our, uh, the tribes, uh, the Wabanaki tribes that are in the state of Maine, um, have, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a back and forth. You know, it kind of depends on who's in office, how things are going. Um, uh, we are the first tribe to ever uh, successfully win a land, uh, or set of tribes to win a, uh, successfully win a set of land claims a uh, uh, case uh, for 12 and a half million acres uh, with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And um, some people would say that, hey, you know, everything was settled, that was it right there, right? But you know, we still exist past that time in 1980. And what's happened in that time is that a lot of those agreements that were made at the time in 1980 have been basically kind of favored or, you know, taken by the state and slanted in their favor and uh, at the expense of uh, sovereignty and other things that our communities have had to, uh, to deal with. So when it comes to how our tribes uh, view the relationship with the state, um, there is a strong relationship. We have a presence in the state house with representatives or non-voting members, but at least they have a presence in the house. Um, but um, you know, our, we're, we're still constantly in a push-pull for our rights, uh, fishing rights and, and other types of things. The rights to have our women protected by the Violence Against Women Act, which uh, we had to have a special you know, addition added on to that law in order to make it happen uh, because of the, uh, the conditioning of the main Indian Land Claim Settlement Act. Uh, once again, that slanting toward the power towards the state of Maine. Um, so when it comes to the government relationships, Right now, we're seeing an upswing, but we just went through an administration that you know, caused a severe downswing. So it kind of goes back and forth. Uh, with the current governor right now, we've had some really uh, tremendous things that have happened uh, for, for a social justice movement and that uh, the state of Maine finally passed Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, of course, Hartford did too, right? <laughs> um, and uh, also, um, uh, this uh, state of Maine is also the first state to pass a uh, state law that bans the use of native mascots. Uh, so stereotypical misrepresentation is uh, now, you know, falling uh, fast, and we're getting uh, native people represented properly through educational laws. There's actually a law that requires Wabanaki studies. So those are things that are on the upside. Uh, so it's always kind of a back and forth. Um, but that long history of uh, state uh, welfare agencies taking our children and continuing to do it even after the, uh, the creation of the Indian Child Welfare Act has led to generations of people that grew up 
through that system. And uh, for them to feel reconciliation, that's a personal choice of their own. And I'm not going to answer that question for them. Uh, but truth, right? Truth is how we get to a sense of healing for oneself. And uh, for those children that were taken in that foster care uh, 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 system uh, at very high rates, a lot of them went through some very, very difficult things. Uh, and a lot of times they did not believe that what they, were say or what they had happened to them would be believed, even by our own community members. Um, so Donland and the Wabanaki uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the work of Wabanaki Reach have finally gotten those folks that went through that to tell their truths. And for each of them, it's a personal journey. But now we're seeing people that at first would say, I can't talk about this, that are now out in public speaking about it and talking about it and getting that truth out there so that we learn from the lessons of the past so that we don't commit them going forward. So what is the, the condition of truth and reconciliation uh, in the, on the state of Maine uh, and reclaiming ancestral land? Um, you know, it's, it's going to be a long battle uh, because we still have to deal with the intergenerational trauma uh, internally. However, uh, right now we are in a good place with the state of Maine. Um, we will never reclaim all of our ancestral territory, but uh, hopefully all of our rights. Uh, the rights to exist by fishing, hunting, all of those things that existed way before the U.S. government or the main state government ever existed uh, are actually uh, valued and uh, properly uh, um, followed and, uh, um, and respected. Um, what are your hopes uh, for this and similar efforts? Um, just as uh, the senior advisor to the film Don Land and someone that's been to many, many screenings uh, and seeing the effect of the film and how it has on people, um, I have hope because a lot of times people ask, what can we do, right? What are things that we can do? What, what, what can we as a community do to do a better job going forward? So when I hear those types of questions, right, these forward thinking questions, not just thinking about what happened in the past and how wrong it was, but thinking about the future and how we make it better for ourselves, I do have hope. Um, and I think this awareness, this realization of truth uh, that we see from Native peoples when our voices get lifted up into these mediums that we all get to see like this uh, is one of those ways to get that done. Uh, so that's why I worked on that film uh, uh, with, uh, with the filmmakers uh, because this was something that meant a whole lot to me uh, because these were my blood relatives, uh, these were the people I grew up with, these are uh, folks that are my entire life and my homeland is associated with them, my culture, uh, my heart is associated with that homeland. Uh, therefore, um, uh, I, uh, you know, did this, uh, I, I work hard for them and I do have a lot of hope because now when I come out and I see these audiences, look at all the interests that we have here in this topic here tonight, people wanting to learn that when we learn better, we do better, right? I always repeat that. Uh, uh, Maya Angelou, I think, might have said it first, uh, or most famously said it. Somebody probably said it a long time ago, but that's something that we all try to uh, aspire amongst ourselves, is that when we know better, we do better. So what do we do going forward? Uh, and I do have hope. whoever said for us to come up here to ask the question. We really appreciate that. <laughs> no pressure. So my question is this. On the description for tonight's event, it said that this is a tribute to the people that the tribes that lived in the Hartford area. And I really got present to the fact that as a, I'm not an academic, but as a person who has a general interest in history and who's traveled quite a bit, uh, how little information there are on Native people in New England. And, you know, what a huge gap there is in terms of my own understanding. So, for instance, you know, what, you know, what took place, you know, with, um, you know, Native people when Europeans came? You know, like, did they move to other areas in New England? 
uh, what was their relationship with the congregational church, slavery. I mean, there's, you know, what happened to the kinship, you know, with um, all, all these things that, all these pressures that took place. And, um, and even just like progressing to today, I mean, there's like a huge transition that took place. And I haven't come across any of that anywhere, really. I haven't, you know, I haven't searched in academic textbooks, but I'm just saying that, you know, out in the world, I'm not seeing it. So that's my question. You know. my, my, my response to that has a lot to do with, uh, my response to your question has a lot to do with how my life has been shaped. When I was in high school, I got good marks in history, but I didn't have the passion for history that I developed until after I graduated from high school. When I found out there were things that they weren't teaching me in school that were more relevant to me, because all the people that were great in the history I had to learn were people who did owned slaves. George Washington owned 300 slaves. Thomas Jefferson wrote that famous declaration, owned 200 slaves. So all those contradictions uh, came into my mind and I kept digging and digging until I found all the answers that were surgically removed. And I have to use that term, it was surgically removed. I've had proof of that in talks that I've given in places or talks that I've been to where I heard uh, Benjamin Labari, who uh, is supposed to be recognized as one of the greatest authorities on maritime history of New England. He's written so many books about the subject, you might see them in some of the libraries. Maybe this one right here next to us. But he spoke at URI's uh, 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 Callis Auditorium back in 19, uh, 1989, and uh, his topic was the maritime history of New England. And I was a proverbial fly in the bottle of milk in that filled the capacity auditorium, okay? <laughs> and I waited patiently to see if anyone was going to ask the question that was begging to be asked by his presentation. Because in his entire presentation, he skipped over the slave trade and uh, in spite of the fact that it took place uh, uh, for 75 continuous years right outside the doorway of that building, which was right on the shores of Narragansett Bay. And because I had been uh, uh, researching slavery and its impact on our people here in New England for uh, all of that time period before that, all of that was fresh in my mind. So when it came time for the questions, and I saw no one else was asking the question, begging to be asked, I naturally uh, stood up and I asked him the question, is there any reason why that was surgically removed when there was 75 continuous years of uh, slavery right outside the doors uh, of this uh, institution that we're in right now? And you want to see someone change color so many times in a <laughs> short period of time. And uh, finally, he answered in a way so if he was Pinocchio, his nose would have went all around the whole auditorium. <laughs> And uh, he said, no, there was no answer. Now, you know that was a lie. A man who's written all those books about the maritime history and connected with Mystic Seaport, too, don't forget that right here in your own backyard. He's uh, surgically removed that from his entire presentation. And I didn't hear another soul in that whole auditorium after I finished, they were all elders now, but a lot of them have gone on to meet the maker since then. Uh, Ball-headed uh, uh, white men and women with the blue rinsed hair and all that. <laughs> they weren't going to be around very long. And so in spite of that fact, none of them had any questions or anything that would remind uh, everyone else in that auditorium of my question. It had to be denied completely, and that's why that was my best uh, ammunition for the point that I made over and over using that illustration that the history has been surgically removed in order to make patriotism possible. It's something that's uh, all uh, in, 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 uh, involved in the uh, culture of deception and denial we live in. We can't tune on our TV without hearing deception and denial. Everything they're trying to sell is that we don't need to tell them those we need, okay? If that doesn't work, then they call the telemarketers call on the phone. And I get this all the time because I'm retired, okay? And I'm on everybody's list. So it all has to do with the deception and denial that this country is based on. That's why you have profits before people, and that's why when the Sandy Hook massacre took place right here in Connecticut, 
uh, so many of the media people erroneously referred to it as the worst massacre in U.S. history. I knew that wasn't true because only about two hours away at uh, the banks of the Mystic River was where uh, 400 men, women, and children, our beautiful little babies, were burned alive. And that wasn't that far from there. In the, in, in the, uh, the uh, massacre that took place at Sandy Hook, most people don't realize that was exactly 249 years after the anniversary of the Paxton Boys Massacre. That I don't know if you've even heard of it, okay? The Paxton Boys Massacre of six peaceful Conestoga Indians at Lancaster, Pennsylvania, then storming the workhouse on December 27, two days after Christmas, the season of goodwill towards men again. They slaughtered the 14 peaceful Indians they had missed on December 14, including one young boy with extreme brutality. On December uh, 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 14th, uh, the Sandy Hook School Massacre took place at New Newtown, Connecticut on two December 14, 2012, where 20 innocent children and six teachers were slaughtered by a deranged young gunman. Uh, most Americans are totally unaware of the connection between the two massacres. I don't think there's anyone in this room that probably is aware of that now. And when I became aware of it, I knew it had to be made known to everybody, okay? Because it's my business to be the zoom lens, as I said in my statement of purpose and whatever time I have left here on this earth. Because we didn't have cell phones and zoom lenses back in that time, and that's why you didn't hear of it. It was all swept under the carpet of America's history that needs to be shaken out now. Because it was written in the Bible that was brought to us. Uh, uh, Chris made some reference about, about the truth, talking about Dawnland. It said in the Bible that was brought to us, because we are considered pagans, said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's why we're not free today. The victims and the beneficiaries of the injustice are not free, because the truth has not been known. And that's my mission for the rest of my life, is to make the truth known. So that's why I'm here. So remember all those things and put them together. I'll just, I'll just add a little bit, since for probably the last 20 or 25 years, Tall Oak has sat right here on my shoulder as I've been doing all of my research and doctoral work. Um, I grew up in Ledger, Connecticut, um, where the homelands of the Pequot community um, are. And as I was going to my elementary school and, and junior high school, um, learning a little bit about local history, uh, one of the things that struck me uh, was that the history of the Pequot War declared Pequots to be extinct. There were no more Pequots. And at the same time, one of my close friends and where I would spend quite a bit of time um, in the summers on the reservation was right next to me, a Pequot person, um, which, which really stood in stark contrast um, to what I was reading in the textbooks. Mm -hmm. and, and so from a very young age, I became really aware of this dichotomy and this sort of declaration of extinction of Native people. And, and this awareness that I've, I've confronted in my own scholarship um, has really propelled what I've written about. Um, I, unfortunately, I didn't really get into a whole lot of it, but one of the really striking things um, in colonial histories and the successful the attempted success of erasure of Native people is really through documents, mm -hmm. um, relabeling people. Um, the word Indian actually carries legal and political weight um, as, as, a, as a, a, a legal entity. Um, it's a word that's captured in the Constitution. It's a word um, that conveys certain rights about people as opposed to um, what was what Native people were commonly relabeled as, which was colored, musty, mulatto, um, and other terms that didn't convey any rights. Mm -hmm. And during during the um, during the 18th century, uh, what we saw was a series of colonial censuses take place through the mid-century. And every one of those censuses, whether it was 1756, 1762, 1774. Every one of those censuses in southern New England showed an increasing native population. 
all the way through, rapidly increasing, partly birth rates, partly better documentation, and so on. In 1790, with the first federal census, zero Indians. Zero. And it stayed that way until 1870. So you can imagine this, this very deliberate process of erasure and how that's captured both in documentary history but in public perception when that becomes codified in, in popular literature like The Last of the Mohicans. Right, so this, and, and I can't tell you from that moment that Fenimore Cooper wrote that, the poems that emerged after that talked about the last of the Pequots and the last of the Narragansetts and the last of the Nipmucks and the last of every tribe. It's this systemic erasure, this, this idea that Native people are no more. Um, and you know, it's it's you know, at the museum we would talk about the, the obituaries of native people and, and individuals who were labeled the last of. But every one of those last ofs had children and grandchildren listed in the obituaries. So it makes you really wonder what are we talking about? So this has really propelled, you know, our thinking of this um, in, in what we're working on as Aga Mountain is the native communities are coming together to redefine their histories. Um, and I, I, um, oh, I had a thought, now it's lost. Um, yeah, all right, well, oh, I, I did want to add, because there was a question about the people here. So the, for those of you who don't know, the Tunxis uh, Indians um, of the sort of homelands in the Farmington and broader areas um, of Hartford, this was a, a politically autonomous tribal group um, that largely migrated out of this area in the late 18th century during a, a religious uh, Indian migration called Brotherton or Brothertown. Um, the, about seven tribes in southern New England secured, they were, they were tired of the nonsense of having land stolen, they were tired of, of the, the trickery and the erasure and the alcohol and all the corrupting forces and influences of their neighboring um, English people. And they said, we're out of here. And they secured 15,000 acres of land from the Oneida tribe in central New York and migrated there. And then over time, some of the same situations emerged and they got tired of that and they began looking for other places and they eventually settled on a place in Wisconsin and settled there. So the contemporary Brotherton tribe, which is composed of descendants from communities in southern New England, is now in... Um, Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Wisconsin and surrounding areas. Yeah. They didn't stay in one place because they were crowded right. out again by people greedy for them. And these land. stories are everywhere. These stories are everywhere, but people persist. Their homelands remain. And uh, even in the modern day times, um, in the 1980s, uh, the state of Connecticut passed a law that the last Friday of every September, uh, by governor, it actually orders the governor to proclaim that day Connecticut Indian Day. Um, and I've lived here for about 25 years, and I've never seen that proclamation get made. Um, and also in the law, it also states that the public schools are supposed to commemorate that day and teach about Connecticut's five in, uh, Indian tribes. So if we're wondering why we don't have that information, we're not following even our own laws here in the state. So this is one of the efforts, once again, I come out, you know, we found this out recently and we're working with the Department of Education. Uh, hopefully, maybe we get a meeting with Ned Lamont and maybe next year, uh, you know, the state follows its own law and we can start to reverse this process. Yeah. Well, thank you all for your presentations. I really appreciate that. Um, uh, I, this past late weekend, I was at a conference on transatlantic slavery in New York, and I learned a new term that I hadn't heard before, um, and it was uh, about how to spot a slave ship on the ocean, open ocean, and it's called kachinga, and it's that you don't spot the ship by sight, but by smell. And, and I was, it just got me to thinking, are there terms in native languages that you that have emerged to describe the atrocities in your own experience to you know just as a way to cope with and reflect upon um, effects of European colonization I 
Um, a I, Tall kind of alluded to it a little bit uh, in, in uh, the names typically uh, Algonquin tribes uh, use. As a, his, he mentioned uh, the term around here, strangers, uh, in my area. It's really a question. What is this? Who is this? Um, you know, so um, when it comes to that, it's really, you know, it's an unknown. But we, we had, uh, you know, prophecies that were, you know, from our peoples. That's one of the reasons for the Anishinaabe migration uh, is because the, the, the tribes on the East Coast, way before colonization ever happened, we had uh, stories that told us about hairy-faced people coming and a lot of death and destruction following afterwards. Um, and so when it comes to that, you know, some people see it uh, almost as uh, a, a piece of that, you know, story coming true. Um, the, so we do have terminology. Uh, I guess you know we do have you know uh, traditional stories that mention uh, things of that sort. Um, but when it comes to those types of definitions right there, um, that would be more uh, I think along the lines of what was happening uh, from the people on the boats, uh, you know, that were coming off the boat. So it's, you know, like view from the boat, view from the shore. Native people being on the shore. Uh, our perspective would have probably been a little bit different, although uh, I do recall reading uh, accounts of uh, just Native peoples remarking about Europeans in general, uh, you know, uh, uh, because all of the boats smelled, uh, basically, to Native people. So from the perspective of Native people, that, that's the best part of it. Um, so these types of terms uh, oftentimes come up in the English language, but not, not necessarily in the same worldview of our languages. Our languages just do not operate on the, uh, 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 the same type of realm. Uh, we describe things as animate or inanimate. We don't have necessarily verbs, uh, you know, things of that sort, you know. So it's, it's a whole different worldview when it comes to the way our languages work. Um, so uh, once again, you know, it, 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 there was probably some of that type of description. Uh, however, um, usually uh, those come from the way we're having it described to us uh, by the, the, the Europeans that were already here. Uh. Just a little uh, more added to that. Uh, I, we didn't have the words that you're looking for, specific words and everything like you would find in the dictionary, but we had our prophecies that spoke in general terms about all these things. Like uh, my and Elder, that I learned a lot of my uh, 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 stories about the uh, um, uh, Mayan people uh, that he shared with me, with my broken Spanish from high school that I was able to communicate best I could. Uh, they spoke of uh, the time being divided in different time periods from the time of the arrival, arrival of Columbus here. In the time of the arrival of Columbus, they, told, uh, they spoke of that as the time of the beginning of the nine hells for Native people. So within that, you had these slave ships and all these other things that come under that, but there wasn't a specific reference to those ships or those incidents like that. But then uh, uh, the time of the uh, 13 heavens was supposed to begin in the year 2012. Well, I guess there's been some delays in that because 2012 has come and it's gone. But a lot of people were trying to look into specific ways to deal with those numbers in that time period. but. What it all goes back to is the time of the great purification that so many of the prophecies of all the tribes speak about in one way or another. The Ojibwe speak, people speak of the uh, seventh fire to be lit by the young people, okay? And that's going on now. You had that young girl from uh, 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 Finland, I think it was, that had Sweden. that... Uh, 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 Sweden. Sweden. Sweden, yeah. One of those Scandinavian <laughs> countries. But anyhow, she... Uh, she organized uh, this movement all over the world. And she's been honored by so many people. And she should have been in school, like she said, but she couldn't because this whole, uh, all the future generations were being condemned by this global warming that no one wanted to acknowledge. And the reason why that's taken place was all for money. She spelled that right out. Profits before people. That's the cause of all the problems that we're having now in this society. My cousin Red Wing, who lived to be 91, the most respected elder in our family, she gave me my name and so many others their names. But she said, all of man's problems come from going against the laws of nature and of nature's God. And that was so profound, I never forgot it. She spoke to, uh, to audiences all over, even at the UN, and she said those things. And they resonate because that's what it all boils down to when you trim off all the fat. 
and they're not going to uh, acknowledge it because no one wants to give up that money. The most significant uh, response to the Sandy Hook massacre, which is the worst one that most of us have uh, lived to see, or except some few that followed it, but uh, the most significant response to that whole atrocity was the increase in gun sales, all because the profits were put before people, okay? It was more important to get more money. So that's how they used that whole terrible thing that happened. All those deaths, those innocent children and the teachers didn't mean anything because the money was more important. So the, 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 the basis of all these problems we're talking about, whether we're talking about the horrors of slavery and talking about the slaughter of native people taking their land, it all goes back to something that a Mohawk elder told me when he came to the first national day of mourning. He's dead and buried now, but his words live on, and I'll share them with you. He said, the basic difference between the society that was brought here and the society that was here was the value system. We follow the value system based on people. The value system brought here was based on things. That's why you have this consumerism. People call on my house trying to sell me uh, uh, new plans for MasterCard and all that other foolishness. It's all that uh, uh, thing about consumerism. All of the things that fill my mailbox, all things trying to get money out of my pocket, okay? <laughs> All of that, and I'm not alone, you can all shake your head because you all can identify that. I'm not the only one that's doing that, uh, uh, experiencing that. But that all goes back to that value system. And unless we look at that, when we look at all these problems, golden, uh, 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 climate change, et cetera, I mean, that's profound. That's gonna affect all of us and our future generations. My beautiful little great nieces and nephew, you know, that the uh, Cricket and Donis have, have brought into this world, they're all going to be affected by that if we don't change that value system. That's the key to the whole thing. But you go to Washington, you bring that up, how much of a response are you going to get? Because everyone there is crooked and corrupt, okay? So we have to find a way to get around that, and the only approach is a spiritual approach. Because politically, we're not going to find the unity and the and the strength that we need in this society. I was involved, over-involved in politics uh, in my younger years when my kids were growing up. I should have stayed at home with them, okay? Because spiritual unity is the only unity that we can work towards and the only one that's gonna work because we need the creator on our side. And if not working for spiritual unity, the creator isn't on your side. If you're trying to find a political unity and think it's gonna work, you're mistaken. It's not gonna work. So all of you here, I mean, uh, some of you are elders as I am, but you have to change the way you think and the way you've been programmed because we've all been programmed by everything we watch and see, everything that comes in, in, into our homes or anything. Can we do one last question? One last question. Yes. Um, so I'm a 15 year old high school student. I go to one of West Harbor Public High Schools. Um, and one of the biggest thing, right, things I've noticed, because um, I'm actually originally from out west, is that there's almost no indigenous education. And one of the big requirements as an educator is you have to write a paper on something that isn't taught in class. And so mine was a lack of indigenous representation in the classroom as well as laws specifically designed to benefit white people over indigenous people. So what changes would you like to see in the curriculum in the classroom? Because what I find is that indigenous and just generally causes that minority strength and are often drawn out by well-intentioned <coughs> white people who really do want to make a difference, but the problem is their desire to help often actually goes over native speakers and um, people of color who are trying to make it, their issues often become a white issue because white people are so eager to help that it often just drowns us out. So what would you like, as for us as white people, what would you want us to do to further your cause? <laughs> He's gonna say. I'm getting a lot of work here. Dueling um, mics. <laughs> <clears throat> so, um, as a, I also uh, work at uh, the Pequot Museum, and uh, one of the things that I always say, uh, you know, as I take students through there, especially high school students as they're learning about American history, um, is that um, 
America didn't start with the Declaration of Independence. There was a set of dominoes that fell to lead to that. Uh, the Declaration of Independence was a declaration from the country of England, but how did the colonies become English? It began with the Pequot War. If the, Pe if the English don't win the Pequot War, they don't sign this paper document. Remember how much we you know, want the paper document nowadays. If you don't own anything, by the way, unless you have a piece of paper that says you own it. Right? This is something America's kind of built on. Uh, when that Treaty of Hartford is signed, um, <clears throat> uh, it, it uh, basically overturns the power struggle, uh, structure here. So, um, and the English end up taking over Pequot territory as part of it, and basically creating a little New England. They even exclude their allies in the war from coming into that territory, so only the English are allowed to live there. Eventually, the Dutch are, you know, moved out of uh, Connecticut. Uh, New Amsterdam becomes New York. More uh, um, uh, colonies get chartered from England, Georgia, others, and eventually, all 13 colonies do become English colonies. But without the Pequot War, if the English don't establish themselves with that war. Then there might have been colonies here on the East Coast, but they might not have all been English colonies. Therefore, the history of this country would have been very, very, very different. Uh, the idea of a United States, or even the idea of, the, I mean, the Declaration of Independence just would not have happened. Therefore, when we teach the history of this country, we got to start with not to, uh, you know, uh, we got to start with the indigenous history, number one. We got to go back uh, and include that there was, you know, millions of people here that existed here for thousands and thousands of years and start our timeline there not with the discoverers, right? Because that's a myth anyway, because we're using the wrong uh, word to describe what they did. They just showed up here. Um, <laughs> so we need to you know, reorient our timeline in our school system to stop teaching history with a baseline that starts with uh, you know, Columbus. And we need to uh, start way back with indigenous uh, occupation of this land. And then when we talk about the creation of this country, we gotta talk about the good, bad, and the ugly of it. And uh, the Pequot War is the domino that leads to English domination of all 13 colonies. And a century and a half later, we have a declaration of independence from the country of England. And if we're not aware of that, um, then we do believe in this false patriotism uh, that uh, um, uh, Talok has been talking about. Uh, Chris, you're on the right path, but you left some key words out in several things that you mentioned, and you're not alone. This is generally done by everyone. When they had that uh, 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 exhibit by the, I think, the American Psychological Society and uh, some other uh, national group, Traveled to the museum. I don't know if you were working there then, but uh, cricket was still on the payroll there before you and Donna's got married. And uh, I told them, you can't change that exhibit because it doesn't belong to the museum. But I told him he had to get a, 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 a transparency and put right over the pot that I always outlined any time I spoke about the Declaration. I never referred to it as the Declaration of Independence. I referred to it as it needed to be referred to. The Euro-American Declaration. We were not declared independent. You read that whole document from start to finish, and all those people that talk about the Constitution in Washington and all those people wearing those uh, uh, flags on their lapel pins and everything. They don't talk about the truth because the, the, the reason why uh, 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 they're not talking about the truth is that the only mention of Native people that's us who are here, was to call us the merciless Indian savages. You read that document, a lot of you don't realize that. I didn't realize that when I was in high school uh, uh, learning about American history the way it was taught. I found out when I learned to be uh, to scrutinize things more and look at everything that was there, we were not declared independent. So why should any Native American celebrate so-called Independence Day or the ringing of the Liberty Bell when all those things took place as I described when I talked about the Liberty Bell all at that same time period. People need to question those things that were never questioned during the time when they should have been. If those things had been questioned then, we wouldn't be having this discussion now. You wouldn't have global warming, you wouldn't have anything else. And the Pequot War was the reason why, but not just the Pequot War, because Pequot War was just a, a dress rehearsal for the next massacre that took place 39 years, 10 minutes up the road from where I live at the Great Swamp in Rhode Island. Because that was the 
slaughter the Pequots, to burn the babies alive so there'd be no future generations, okay? And like I said, that was just a dress rehearsal 39 years later that took place up the road for me. And that's what decided who was going to rule this continent. It was all part of the master plan that John Winthrop Jr. and it's all in, uh, not John Winthrop Jr., John Winthrop in his uh, uh, Winthrop's uh, uh, journal. Anyone that wants to read the journal is right there. He's got a good library right next door. You go and then you find it, okay? He referred to this letter of 1645 from his brother-in-law, another devious lawyer, Emmanuel, a lawyer, Emmanuel Downing, his wife's uh, brother. They had this master plan for the uh, uh, foundation of America and the legacy of privilege they meticulously crafted back then that all the people in this land that get the benefit of that get today. All because it was all deliberately put in there. And it said, I'm paraphrasing, but it said that until we get in the stock of slaves and we declare a just war, quote unquote, on the Narragansett people because they were the strongest tribe at that time period, we cannot get ourselves a stock of enough African slaves to work this land and our children will never see the benefit of this great land. And of course, those were words of words of prophecy. That was the master plan and most of you don't know about that. I didn't know about that until I did all the digging I've done. When I spoke to Yale on Indian slavery uh, uh, in 2013, I think it was, all these academics that were there, I was the only non-academic speaker. I spoke from the perspective of the victim not from the people that are just on the outside looking in. So I had a totally different perspective. A lot of them might have missed that because they relied on the paper that lies, okay? And, uh, but that's what we have to learn from. All those things that have been surgically removed and uh, use all that truth because the truth is the only thing that's going to make us free. We all got to keep digging. We all got to keep looking. Those of you that are still in school, you're still students, dig deeper and deeper because Teachers, uh, when I've gone to schools for years, they've told me they're all uh, uh, complain because they don't have the good information they need. They don't have the books that have been written that tell all the truth. And that, that's why I supplemented their knowledge when I'd come there. But their students, because they had teachers who recognized that deficiency, those students all were better thinkers. They're probably some of the best uh, young people that are out there now. I hope some of them have got into positions where they can make a difference. Because until the things that are questioned that need to be questioned, you're not going to have the mutual respect that should have been there in 1620 when that Mayflower landed. And they're, going to, they're getting ready to celebrate 400 years of the Mayflower being here. I just saw a, a big full page uh, celebration of that fact. Uh, it was uh, in Mystic when they were remodeling the uh, Mayflower II. And this young girl that's a, a distant relative of my, mother, of my, my wife, uh, she's Wampanoag Indian. She has two children I've adopted for my grandsons. I feel so bad because I have to be that critical of their mother. She was there because she loved being in the spotlight. She works at Plymouth Plantation, okay? And she's on Facebook all the time uh, presenting a new image of herself. But she's there for the wrong reasons. She should not have been there glorifying the Mayflower because this 2020 observance that's coming up I hope the creator is going to leave me uh, alive to have something to do with that because when I had my surgery, that's the thing I was most concerned about. I hope the creator would leave me alive with enough, uh, with enough of my memory so that I can have a major role in that because the only uh, uh, response that the Wampanoag people are doing as a group is something I don't agree with. You might see it in some of the publications. Uh, uh, a friend of mine from Mashby, Paula Peters, very influential, uh, family in the politics there. She developed the uh, wampum belt to be presented to the English in commemoration of this date. That has nothing to do with uh, 400 people being slaughtered at the Mystic Massacre and another 300 up the road from me. It had nothing to do with all the blood from sea to shining sea that was shed and taking all of this land out of our hands. It had nothing to do with the fact that this poster I, I have here down here uh, showing that the Native people, uh, Native American people are the only race, the only race on the entire s surface of the earth that is not represented at the UN in any official capacity. That's not just a national disgrace, that's an international disgrace. It's all based on a conspiracy of silence. 
because all those colonizing countries that those people are trying to get away from to come here at that so-called border that never was there because we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us, okay? But what uh, uh, Trump and his redneck supporters, that's where he went for his support base because he knew they thought just like him, okay? That's why he got where he is. What they're afraid of more than anything is the rebrowning of America. Not the browning of America, the rebrowning. Because America was brown before anyone came here from anywhere else. And that's what they're terrified of because they don't want to see the rest of the country become like California because California has already gone through that because they've had that going on for years. But it's going to happen whether you like it or not because you can put all the walls up you want and make them as tall as you want, as wide as you want. But it's not going to stop the prophecies. The prophecies have said, and that's what I'm going to leave you with, this prophecy of our elders has said that our people would come up from the south in increasing numbers to replace all of our people who were slaughtered in the settlement of North America. And that's what's taking place now at the so-called border. That's why our uh, uh, indigenous children are being put in cages, some of them dying, okay? You've got to think about that. Every time you watch the news, remember my words and look at the news with your eyes open and with your minds open so that you understand what you're seeing because the, the media people are all programmed to say the same thing. You tune in one channel after another. No one is saying what I'm saying now, but that's the truth. And the truth will make you free, all of us. The mutual respect that should have been there in 1620, we can build on that if we all work from the position of the truth. It's the only way it's gonna change. And that's a wrap. <laughs> Thank you all for coming.